Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. For North Korean defectors, escaping from North Korea is only the beginning of a long and perilous odyssey towards permanent resettlement in South Korea or elsewhere. The overwhelming majority of defectors start their journey by crossing the Chinese border, stepping foot into a land where they risk arrest and repatriation should they ever be caught. Their status as illegal immigrants makes them vulnerable to all kinds of exploitation, such as forced labor, human trafficking, and prostitution. One organization helping defectors on the ground and smuggling them out of China is Liberty in North Korea, a non-governmental organization headquartered in the United States. We had the pleasure of interviewing its director of research and strategy, Sokil Park, who talked to us about the dangers defectors face in China and Link's mission to provide them with much-needed relief and support. Sokil Park worked for the Korean government and the United Nations before joining Link's sole office, where he's in charge of research and global media outreach. He belongs to the community of global shapers of the World Economic Forum and has lectured about North Korea and Link's operations around the world. So Kiel Park holds a bachelor in psychology from the University of Warwick and an MA in international relations from LSE. So Kiel Park, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you very much for having me. How did you end up working for Liberty in North Korea and what is your role there? So I've been interested in North Korean issues from quite an early age. Uh, my father's Korean and my paternal grandparents are actually from North Hamgyong province. So, you know, the most northeasterly province of the peninsula, which is actually where a lot of the North Korean refugees come from as well. So interested for a long time, but growing up in the UK, it always seemed like a very far away issue, not easy to approach, not that easy to learn a lot about as well. So kind of the mystique of it, I think, added to the interest as well. And then it was really when I was in New York for a graduate internship at the United Nations headquarters over there that I first of all met with people from Liberty in North Korea and I met with ordinary North Korean people who had become refugees for the first time in New York as well. That was the start of getting involved uh, from this angle and getting involved with Liberty in North Korea as an organization. And basically, I haven't looked back since. I started off working with them in the US and then I came out to Seoul a few years ago to help set up the office over here. And my role as Director of Research and Strategy comes at multiple levels. So the first part is the research side, of course. You know, this is a complex, multifaceted issue with which traditionally is seen as quite hard to research. So we think that as one of the organizations working on this, uh, we need to have our own research. You know, we need to be up to date with what's happening with things that are changing. We need to know the issue for ourselves so that we can have the most effective strategies. And then we also need to know it and we need to be researching it constantly because we're also looked to as a source of information and insight uh, on the issue. And there's still too few of those kind of sources, especially for the international community in the English language. So the research uses different kinds of sources, uses, you know, North Korean official sources. But the most interesting and the more unique side, I think, is the access to North Korean refugees themselves that we have as an organization because we are providing humanitarian aid to people who have escaped and coming through China and Southeast Asia through our networks. And so we have quite a unique opportunity to speak with people that have just recently left the country and to get direct insights from them about what's happening in their home communities Uh, sometimes, you know, just days after they actually left. That's one of the most interesting parts, I think. Apart from that, I also work on our strategic communications. So putting all of this research together, you know, doing analysis, as well as the information gathering, and then sharing that through multiple formats, including the documentaries that we produce, the online and offline campaigns that we do, through our organization and also sharing information directly with the international media, with a lot of the journalists that, for instance, are based in Seoul and also with policymakers and various government officials around the world when there are opportunities to do that. 
I think that that covers it. You know, there's other things, day-to-day running of the Seoul office for Liberty in North Korea, overseeing from the strategy aspect our programs there and, and helping to develop the programs, for instance, that we do with resettled refugees that are here in South Korea and those kind of things. Could you describe in a few sentences what the organization does and how it finances itself? So our organization works on North Korea in probably two main ways. The first way is directly with North Korean refugees. So, of course, people are basically not able to come directly to South Korea. They have to go through China and this long circuitous route of, you know, 3,000 miles through China and Southeast Asia normally before they get to South Korea or the United States or other countries where they can resettle. And if you're a North Korean person who's escaped into China just across the river, then you face multiple threats of exploitation, for instance, sexual exploitation for a lot of the female refugees, labor exploitation for male and female refugees. And of course, you may also be caught by the Chinese authorities and repatriated to face a range of harsh punishments back in North Korea. And so basically, these people you know, need assistance. And so we have networks in place to support them and help them come through as quickly as possible through these secret, you know, refugee rescue routes that come through China into Southeast Asia, and then they can resettle mostly to South Korea and just a, a small percentage choose to go to the United States. And then on the resettlement side, we also have resettlement assistance. Obviously, if you're coming from North Korea to South Korea, And it varies a little bit on your background and your experiences through North Korea and China. But often there's so many new things that you have to learn when you arrive in South Korea. And so generally speaking, the first 12 to 24 months is a crucial time when we have programs to help people land on their feet. And then longer term, we have what we call empowerment programs. And that's with the idea that Even if you've been here for a few years in South Korea, uh, you're still not on a level playing field with people that were born in South Korea and you know have all of their family support networks and all those kind of things. And so uh, those programs are mostly education-based and they're designed to help people fulfill their potential in South Korea kind of in the long term. Uh, so that's our refugee work broadly. I should add that it's not just a humanitarian exercise. We also see that as an important strategic aspect of our work in linking back to the issue of North Korea in, domestically inside the country. Because if North Korean refugees are successful in coming to South Korea and then having decent lives and becoming self-sustaining in South Korea, so many of them we've found have been able to re-establish contact back to their home communities in North Korea making phone calls, sending money back home, and basically acting as conduits to information and money going back into the closed system of North Korea, which is helping people at a grassroots level. It's accelerating positive trends inside the country, including marketization, including the opening up of the information environment. And so basically we see North, you know, these North Korean people who are leaving the system as crucial agents of change for helping to open up that system that they've left from as well. So that's one of the strategic reasons why we work with North Korean refugees and defectors and try and maximize on that potential that they have. The other aspect is what we broadly call changing the narrative. And so uh, that's our media efforts to try and change the way that people perceive North Korea to get away from the traditional narrow view of Kim Jong-un and nuclear weapons and missiles and these kind of things that used to be like the, you know, so dominant of the narrative around North Korea internationally and even in South Korea as well. And so we're trying to shift the focus from that or balance it out towards the North Korean people. You know, there are 24 million people up there. It's a society. There are differences in the society. You know, not everybody's the same. Not everybody's brainwashed or these kind of basically dysfunctional views of the North Korean issue. So we're trying to emphasize both the challenges that North Korean people face and the severity of that, but also the way that people are overcoming those challenges and kind of changes that are happening and the progress that we see in the North Korean issue, because that's also one of the kind of areas that there's not enough awareness of still in the outside. And all of these things, you know, this kind of older, more traditional, narrow narrative on North Korea, I think is one of the reasons why there's been traditionally so little support from civil society and from the international community for change strategies, 
support in general for the North Korean people and for this issue. There's still too few NGOs, for instance, that work on this issue. And the NGOs that exist have too little resources. And so we're kind of trying to change the market environment, if you like, for activity and activism on this to bring more support. And one of the ways that we have to do that is by changing just the way that people see the issue to start off with. So again, we do that through documentaries. We do that through social media campaigns, through offline campaigns, particularly in North America, where we have teams of traveling representatives who are doing internships with us. But It's like a remote internship where most of the time they're on the road going around the country and directly engaging with audiences. And it's through media engagement as well and working with all our journalist colleagues and so on. How is all of that finance in the end? Right, so on the financing side, one of the things is that we don't take any money from government sources, whether that be South Korean government or US government or any other kind of government sources. So it's completely privately financed through foundations you know, that provide grants to support our work. And then from diverse sources all the way down to students, you know, around the world that are donating small amounts per month or working with their friends on their campuses to do fundraising. It's pretty diverse. We sell merchandise as well. You know, we try and not rely too much to one source or another because obviously that can create sustainability issues. Yeah, basically it's all down to the amazing community of supporters that we have around the world that believe in our mission and want to contribute to our work. Liberty in North Korea is best known for its refugee rescues. As not everybody is familiar with the situation, why do North Koreans, who already made it out of North Korea, need rescue in the first place? Broadly speaking, North Koreans escaping from the country uh, for various reasons have one option pretty much, and that's to go north into China. Coming south to South Korea is pretty much impossible. I think that roughly over the last five years, only 65 people have managed to make it directly from North Korea to South Korea without going through China. And 59 out of 65 have come through the sea route on various kinds of boats, or actually I think there were a couple of swimmers as well. And then six people actually amazingly managed to come just directly overland. And those would be, you know, frontline North Korean soldiers just coming across the DMZ. So apart from, you know, 65 over the last five years, more than 10,000 people have made it through China and then mostly through Southeast Asia. Because nowadays you can't come from China directly to South Korea, pretty much. Those kind of routes are shut off as well. So once you as a North Korean person have escaped, you know, across the river into China and I was there earlier last year and it's one thing to look into North Korea and imagine, you know, what it's like to live there and those kind of things. But it's another to look from that border into China and imagine that you're a North Korean person that maybe doesn't know anybody, maybe doesn't really have any money, maybe doesn't have any contacts and you somehow have to get through this huge country of China without getting caught by somebody that might exploit you or by the Chinese authorities and you have to get to a third country, you know, in Southeast Asia or Mongolia or somewhere else. And that's that's extremely daunting. And so we therefore have those kind of networks in place. Sometimes we can even be in contact with people before they've left North Korea. And sometimes we're kind of picking people up and identifying them after they've made it to, to China. And so, you know, some of the exploitation that North Korean refugees may face in China would be fundamentally down to the fact that they don't have any kind of legal protection there. So, you know, because the Chinese authorities don't recognize them as refugees, you know, they instead treat them as illegal migrants and would arrest them and send them back to North Korea. It means that if you're in an abusive relationship, if you've been sold to a Chinese man, for instance, as a female refugee, or if you're working for an employer in a factory or, you know, in a restaurant, then they can exploit you and know that you don't have any recourse to authorities. You can't turn them, your employer in because your employer will just turn you in and there's a much bigger risk to yourself. So that's the basis of the exploitation. And then sexual exploitation can take various forms, including sexual trafficking, being sold to Chinese men in a lot of those rural areas up in the Northeast, 
there is a real lack of marriageable women for the only sons that are in the rural areas and a lot of the women have moved to the cities and so on and there's also brothels and online sex chatting type work that a lot of these women are being exploited through there's you know an unknown number of people being exploited or having to hide from authorities and facing that kind of risk on a daily basis still today and so that's one of the reasons why we have that kind of network in place in order to identify people and then bring them through as safely and as quickly as possible without any kind of condition placed on themselves and without any kind of cost as well because all of those costs are provided for by our supporters what awaits those who are caught in China and sent back to North Korea? Yeah, so over the last few years, and really we've seen an uptick again since 2012, which was you know the first year of the rule of Kim Jong-un, and also when Xi Jinping was coming in in Beijing as well. And there was an uptick in border security on both sides of the border between North Korea and China, and also an uptick in security in general in China, extending away from the border, even all the way down to, you know, the south of the country and North Korean refugees being caught when they'd almost got all the way out of China into Southeast Asia. So this was, you know, kind of a new level of risk that affected North Korean refugees and our work as well. And uh, when North Korean refugees are caught and sent back to North Korea, broadly it depends on different factors, but I think that one of the biggest ones is what they were suspected of doing when they were in China, or I guess what kind of crime they're suspected of. So for instance, if you're suspected of meeting with South Koreans or Christians or Americans when, when you were in China, or of trying to get all the way to South Korea, something kind of more serious, then you, your punishment would be proportionally higher. Whereas if you were just suspected of temporarily trying to go to China to maybe do a bit of work, maybe meet somebody and come back quickly, then you're not seen as as much of a threat, as much of kind of an anti-government kind of figure or anti-system. You're not going to be uh, suspected of spying or being in contact with hostile networks and those kind of things. That's how their narrative works in, in their country, right? But as a minimum, you would have investigation typically with the POIBU, which is the National Security Agency. And that typically does involve torture, you know, beatings and these kind of things. You know, if you're being investigated in North Korea, then that's kind of a par for the course, you know, according to North Korean refugees very consistently. That can go on for weeks. And then forced labor for a period of months is also a typical thing. And, you know, there's forced labor and the kind of conditions and their treatment there can be pretty brutal. They're not being fed properly, of course. They may be relying on visits from relatives to actually supplement their food. And the other thing that links into that is mitigation from various forms of punishment through bribery. So if you do have relatives in North Korea or in South Korea that have made it actually to South Korea without being caught, then if your relatives have that kind of cash, then they can bribe the relevant officials and lower the punishments or get you out of uh, detention facilities and those kind of things. So there's not one like blanket punishment that North Korean refugees face. Depends on what you're suspected of doing and uh, how much it can be mitigated by bribery and so on. But torture, forced labor, and in the worst cases, years of detention, even in a political prison camp, those kind of things could be awaiting you if you're caught in China and then sent back. A few weeks ago, we spoke with Yeon So Lee, who is herself a prominent refugee from North Korea. She spent a decade in China before making it to South Korea. Do many refugees get stuck in China and establish their life in hiding there? Yeah, and I think that this was more the case several years ago, you know, when the first waves of North Korean refugees started coming out and there weren't really the networks or the options for them to come to South Korea. You know, so a lot of these people did stay in China for years and years. Nowadays, there are still people that are coming to South Korea and they've been in China for years or there are still North Korean refugees that are there currently and they may have been there for years and may have managed to eke out some kind of stability in their lives there and some kind of consistency, for instance, by you know living with a Chinese man and just kind of living under the radar of the Chinese authorities. 
and uh, managing to stay out of trouble. But increasingly now we actually find that North Korean refugees are coming to South Korea more quickly, you know, without staying in China for as long. And that's due to various factors. But again, it's related to the increased security situation in China in general. And it's also related to the fact that people have more option through broker networks, through organizations like ourselves, and through relatives that have already made it to South Korea. In the early days of refugee flows, there wasn't really any base of people that were already in South Korea that could help pull people through and make those kind of connections and provide resources. But now there are 28,000 North Korean refugees that have resettled already in South Korea. And so these people are helping to bring through their relatives and friends and so on in a much more quicker and more efficient way. You mentioned earlier a journey of around 3,000 miles uh, that these refugees have to make. What route do we have to imagine? Unfortunately, this is one of those things where I can't go into too many details, but typically these people are escaping from North Korea on the east side of the border, so from North Hamgyong province or from Yangang province, and so they're ending up in the eastern part of northeast China and, you know, going into Jilin provinces, and then they're going all the way through using different modes of transport, different ways that you can imagine going over land you know they'll probably use several of those forms and going all the way to south china and then crossing borders into southeast asia and actually different countries in southeast asia maybe used as transit countries and then from there they're much safer you know once they've got out of china There have been cases of people being repatriated even from Southeast Asian countries, but normally they're much safer there and then they can seek resettlement to South Korea or the United States. And the process to come to South Korea is fairly well established, kind of been worked out with the local authorities. And so people are coming here and then they have the processing in South Korea. So they go through the National Intelligence Service debriefing and investigation and then they go through the Hanawon South Korean resettlement education facility and before they actually just live in South Korea as a citizen here. This might be a somewhat of a naive question, but why don't they just go to Russia? North Korea does share a very short border with Russia on the north side, on the east, of course. But there's not really routes going through Russia. And one of the reasons is that it's just there's so little population And even if you can travel into Russia, then there's not a definite route then, you know, if you end up in Vladivostok, for instance, or somewhere, or even if you got all the way to Moscow, there's not a definite process to then come to South Korea. There have been some refugees that have seemed to have come through Russia, but it seems to be dealt with on kind of an ad hoc way. And there have been cases reported where North Korean refugees have been sent back to China as well. So it's not definite, it's not easy. And so even if going all the way through China into Southeast Asia is a lot longer, the geography and the general, you know, level of population and the infrastructure of routes and, and travel and so on uh, is just better place. That That's another reason why people go to Southeast Asia instead of going to Mongolia, for instance. Mongolia is, is closer than Southeast Asia from Northeast China. But the geography of it is just so difficult. And you know, there have been people that have died trying to cross the Gobi Desert, for instance, whereas the geography going towards Southeast Asia is not so perilous, basically. Another very naive question. Why don't they just go to the South Korean embassy in Beijing? So the embassy routes did used to be used much longer ago, you know, kind of late 90s, early 2000s. There were people that were not just going into the South Korean diplomatic outposts, but European consulates and, and embassies and the U.S. diplomatic outposts as well. But basically, the Chinese government worked quite hard to shut that route down, both just by simple physical security around these diplomatic compounds. And so if you go to these places in Shenyang, which is very close to North Korea, or in Beijing, then there's... Chinese security on the outside of the compounds that would be hard for a North Korean refugee without any papers to get through. That's just a very simple measure. The other thing is 
pressure diplomatically on those countries to not have North Korean refugees coming through that route. Because at the end of the day, even if you made it into one of these embassies, you have to come out eventually and come on to a third country or make it to South Korea. And that requires the permission of the Chinese authorities. So even if you got into the, for instance, South Korean embassy in Beijing, then it's basically forcing the South Korean government to do a deal with the Chinese government to eventually issue uh, an exit permit for this person to come out of the embassy, get on a plane and leave China. And the Chinese government just put a lot of effort into shutting that down and just not playing ball with those governments and not doing deals. And so you had cases of North Korean refugees being stuck in these kind of places for years in some cases. And sometimes it was just a better option actually for them to leave the embassy or consulate or wherever they were and take their chances and just try and go through Southeast Asia. So Basically, the Chinese government has worked to shut down that kind of embassy route, and they've been effective in doing so. So how long does that process take, leaving through the Southeast Asian route? So the process, uh, it, it of course varies from case to case, and depending on security situations uh, in, in various areas. And there is some processing that has to happen on the Southeast Asian side as well. But... A lot of the travel can happen in a week or two weeks or, you know, this kind of small number of days, smallish number of days. And then some of the processing kind of depends on which country you're in and so on. But let's keep it kind of broad and a little bit vague. But somebody could leave North Korea and be in South Korea, you know, on South Korean territory within one to two months. Is South Korea always the destination of those journeys? So through our organization, North Korean refugees can choose to and we inform them of their options to come to South Korea or go to the United States. Both of those countries have explicit programs to accept North Korean refugees and they have the kind of process in place in Southeast Asia that that can happen through. You know, there have been North Korean refugees that have resettled in other countries in Europe or in Japan or in Canada. This has happened in different ways or, you know, using different kinds of routes or processes. But through us, they're coming to South Korea in the vast majority of cases. That's kind of the natural default choice for them. That's the obvious one. You know, if they have an idea of leaving China and resettling in a different country, then South Korea is the obvious one that's culturally, linguistically and and socially and so on closer to what they expect, even if all of those things are a little bit different than North Korea. Around 5% or a little bit less than 5% of the people that we work with are choosing to go to the United States. And this is out of over 400 people that we've helped to come through over the last few years. Most of this is in the last, you know, two or three years. Once the individual is in Southeast Asia, is there any significant difference in how difficult it is to get to the US or to South Korea or any other country? Yeah, the broad difference is that coming to South Korea, the processing is on the back end, meaning after you've come to South Korea. And so that would be when the NIS is checking out whether you're actually a North Korean refugee and whether you might pose some kind of a threat or as a North Korean agent or official, some kind of thing like that. Whereas the US process, and this is standard for them around the world, is that the processing and background checks and those kind of things happen out of country. So where you are. So in Southeast Asia, for the case of North Korean refugees, the processing and background checks is done there before they get on a plane and go to the United States. So it can actually be a similar amount of time, roughly, if you add NIS processing and Hanawon uh, resettlement training and education together, you know, that can be six months for a North Korean refugee in South Korea before they're just living in complete freedom as a citizen in South Korea. Going to the United States, it depends on how long the checks take and how long the process is, but it can take six months or more. For some people, it can even take more than a year. But That's not actually unique to North Korean refugees. That's actually the case for the U.S. is accepting tens of thousands of refugees from all over the world, you know, Syria, lots of parts of Africa, lots of parts of Asia. And it typically takes several months for them to go through all of that before they can go to the United States. So it's not just about North Korean refugees. Your website states that, and I quote, 
it cost $3,000 to rescue one refugee and empower them in their new life. Could you explain us where that money goes? Sure. So actually, the best information that I can share with you on that would be directly on the website. So listeners could check that out on libertyinnorthkorea.org as well, because I can't remember the exact dollar breakdowns there. But it goes to staffing costs for people that are in the field and helping people to come through. It goes to accommodation, food, that kind of basic protection for North Korean refugees as they come through. And it goes to the various kind of fees that are, have to be paid to bring people through. And then out of that, there is a portion, as it says on the website, which is dedicated to supporting them in the resettlement phase and into the long term of that as well. And so that goes to the initial resettlement assistance, more tailored and more intensive for when people first arrive in South Korea and they do need more assistance to kind of land on their feet and to figure out what they're going to do and to become self-sustaining people. But then in the long term as well, you know, working with these people to maximize their potential and to really get going in the long-term direction that they want to do through our empowerment programs. Do you have a full-time staff in China or do you work with Chinese on a, so to speak, freelance basis? Yeah, um, so we don't have staff that are based full-time in China. We're working with networks and partners that are on the ground that we're working with consistently, but they wouldn't be classed as link staff. You spoke of the policy that China has regarding North Korean refugees. Do Liberty North Korea's activities in China therefore take place in a legal gray zone or even in clear violation of Chinese law? Yeah, unfortunately, the Chinese government makes it illegal to provide assistance to North Korean refugees. That is their policy. That's part of their policy of forcibly repatriating North Koreans who have crossed the border illegally and sending them back to North Korea. And so our work there has to basically contravene, you know, Chinese law. But there's no other way of doing it. That humanitarian assistance is crucial. And in an ideal world, it could happen legally and above board. But if you wanted to operate legally, then you couldn't help North Korean refugees and you couldn't provide humanitarian assistance. So in the long term, we would, of course, want to see Chinese policy change. But Chinese policy is pretty entrenched uh, on this issue at this time. And we don't see a realistic window of opportunity for that to change or for activism to be able to change the fundamental background behind that policy. And so our focus is on helping people despite the policy rather than focusing too much on trying to change the policy and these kind of things. So basically working around the policy. Are Liberty North Korea's rescues operations always successful? Or are there cases in which you provide support to refugees, but for one reason or the other, uh, something goes wrong? Yeah, so this is one of the areas where it's difficult to talk about, both for operational security reasons, but also because it is a tragedy, you know, whenever something is not successful in the field. Not all of our work is successful. Uh, we do place a really high priority on operational security. We think about that a lot. We really try not to take risks. There's, of course, like some element of risk if you're working in the field. And so we are able to maintain an extremely high success rate with our field work, but it's not 100%. Um, it's actually quite close to 100%, but it's not 100%. And you know, for security reasons and for the protection of the people that are coming through the network and for some of those unsuccessful cases, we can't provide like a real-time success rate to the outside world. But it's, it, is a, it is a tragedy and it's a real risk that we face with this work. And, you know, it's something that we have to work through basically as an organization. But kind of on the optimistic side we've been able to bring through 145 people last year for instance we've been able to bring through over 400 people in total the amount of work that we've been able to do has been increasing year on year over the last several years and we've been able to manage that through 
security crackdowns and whilst maintaining very high security and really minimizing the risk to the North Korean refugees and the other kind of people that we work with out there. So, yeah. How do North Koreans normally get in touch with you uh, in the first place and where? So North Korean people are normally accessing our networks and coming in touch with us through two main ways. The first way would be through people that we already know, you know, mostly in South Korea. So North Korean refugees who have resettled here and know of our organization, maybe they've come through our organization or maybe they're just aware of us or they're involved with different programs that we run in South Korea. And then they're in contact with people back in North Korea. It may be their brother or their mother or a friend or somebody else that they're aware of that wants to come out. Then that's, you know, in general, a safer way that we can be in contact with people. They've already been vetted to a certain extent by being in contact with somebody that we know in South Korea. There will be a vetting that would go on but it makes it a little bit easier because we can be in contact and know, for instance, when this person might be leaving North Korea and then be better placed to then pick them up and bring them through our network quite quickly. The other way would be North Korean refugees who are already in China and, you know, are living in this case of kind of limbo and facing the risk of being caught and repatriated and so on. And these people would come into our networks basically through the contacts that we have on the ground in northeast China and North Korean refugees come into contact with these people and then if they're expressing a need or a desire to leave China but they they need that kind of assistance then they go through the vetting and then they're able to come through. You mentioned a vetting system what does it entail and why is it done? Sure. So people need to be vetted, of course, at some level, because there is the risk of either North Korean government or Chinese government interference or disruption of our networks. Somebody could pose as a North Korean refugee in order to gain access to our networks in order to expose it or to get people arrested and those kind of things. And so people have to be vetted. I, unfortunately, and I think probably for reasons that could be guessed, I can't really include information about what that would really look like, but it seems to be kind of working. So during the actual journey, what type of obstacles are refugees expected to face? Uh, for example, are there frequent passport controls? Yeah, I mean, people that have traveled through China or live there will know that it is basically a country where you need to show papers, you know, when you're getting bus tickets or train tickets and these kind of things, or if you're staying in hotels. Uh, so in general, it can be a challenge if you don't have any papers. And so people are having to evade basically those kind of checks from the authorities and, and get all the way through in safety. Let's take a step back and look at the greater picture. In 2015, and according to the Ministry of Unification, almost 1,300 refugees made it to South Korea. Do we also know how many made it out of North Korea and into China, but not to a third country? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, this is the kind of area where it's very difficult to get statistics because, of course, there's no North Korean statistics on the number of people that are escaping. There's no Chinese statistics on the number of people that are arriving or being caught and sent back. There's, a, of course, zero transparency on those kind of things. And even if you're working there on the ground, then you only know what you're in contact with and you don't have the bigger picture. So it's basically very hard to know things like how many people are leaving North Korea, what percentage of them are making it to South Korea, and how many people are being sent back, and those kind of things. The best thing that we have to work with is the official numbers that are released, as you said, by the Ministry of Unification here, which is the number of arrivals. And then you can kind of back into whether it looks like flows are increasing or decreasing, but there are those unknown factors, so it's it's just a difficult area to research. The number of refugees' arrivals in South Korea last year have been at a 13-year low. Did Liberty in North Korea notice a decline in the numbers, and do you have any explanation for that? Yeah, so we also you know pay a lot of attention to these kind of numbers that are coming out of the South Korean government, and broadly speaking, you know, not just with the decrease last year, but there's been a decrease since 2011. 
the last year under Kim Jong Il, and then to 2012, it decreased by almost half, went down to 1,500 from 2,700, and then since then it's gone, you know, 1,500, and then down to 1,400, and then last year just less than 1,300. And so this is a trend that we're watching and that we're concerned about, of course. There were different reasons for that, and there's different people that maybe have different ideas and their analysis on it. But I think that broadly speaking, there's an agreement that it's an interplay between different factors. And the primary thing is the big increase in border security on both sides of the North Korea-China border, and then the security situation in China as well, as I mentioned before. And so, you know, this is very consistently been reported through different sources, whether it be North Korean refugees themselves saying that the border security is a lot higher than it used to be several years ago. People that are working on the border, including foreigners and people who are helping North Korean refugees come through. It's more difficult. The prices of bribes and so on are increasing and the security situation in China is getting worse. Those are all pretty widely acknowledged facts. It's not the only factor, though. It does seem to be interplaying with the gradually and generally improving North Korean economy. And the economy, it should be emphasized, is improving not because of the North Korean government. It's improving, if anything, despite of the North Korean government. It's improving because of marketization being driven by private actors within North Korea and the North Korean people themselves generally. And more trade and linkage with the Chinese economy and so on has seen a gradual improvement of the North Korean economy, which interplays with the border security because the cost-benefit analysis has changed now, right? So whereas several years ago, uh, maybe more than 10 years ago, the economic situation for a lot of people in North Korea was so desperate that you may as well, kind of if you had the opportunity to try and escape into China, then you're risking your life either way. So risk your life and try and go into China and then, you know, survive in China. Nowadays, it's less so for that kind of survival escape. It's people increasingly that can survive in North Korea. They're living with enough food on a day-to-day basis. I mean, there is still malnutrition, but it's maybe just not at quite the starvation levels that it used to be. And then if you add the factors of things are slightly better economically in North Korea and the risk and cost of trying to escape has really increased, then uh, I think that you get a cost-benefit analysis where more people are saying, well, maybe we'll sit this out for a little bit. Maybe we'll wait, you know, hold on. People are generally hopeful, right, about their lives and about the future. And so let's see if things kind of die down, the border security kind of reverts back a little bit. And then maybe if we have some assistance, then maybe we can try and escape. There's other things that are going on as well. You know, there's a change in the information environment. There's a change in the propaganda strategies of the North Korean government around the defection issue itself as well. But, you know, according to North Korean refugees, it is these different factors that are playing in. And they also do say that there's a lot of people in North Korea that would escape from their own home communities if they had the opportunity and if they had access to a route that wouldn't be that high level of risk leaving North Korea and coming all the way through China. What about things on your hand? Is the work of supporting refugees getting easier or harder? Uh, On the one hand, North Koreans and Chinese authorities are cracking down more heavily than ever, but the linkages between North Korean citizens and the outside world seem to be growing stronger. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I would say that overall, it is getting more difficult just because one of the biggest constraints to our work is the security situation on the border and more broadly in China. And that, as I mentioned, you know, there has been an uptick in that since around 2012. And there was already a trend of actually a worsening security situation before that, but there was kind of a ramping up of it with the political transitions and since then as well. But, you know, as you mentioned, the 
proliferation of mobile phones, including in North Korea, and the ability of a lot of people in the border region to use Chinese mobile phones that are smuggled in and then can still access the Chinese signal. And then people can be in contact, people in South Korea or in China, and that can really facilitate this kind of movement. That is something that's been happening for several years as well, but it's something that wasn't available in the early years of North Korean refugee flows. And so those kind of technologies and those kind of communication links have been helping to mitigate some of the increase in the security situation. But basically, the security situation is still the primary constraint. On a slightly more critical note, the website of Liberty in North Korea is tracking for its bright colors and the many photos of smiling refugees. Isn't this portrayal omitting part of the story? Many refugees face discrimination and economic hardships in other countries. Their suicide numbers are high. Some even want to return to North Korea. And the interview I mentioned previously with Hyun So Lee is testament of how hard life can be once you reach the South. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, I don't want people to misunderstand our communication on this issue. We do emphasize a lot of the challenges that North Korean refugees face, North Korean people face within the country, and the dangers that they face coming through, and the challenges that they face in their resettlement in South Korea or other countries as well. But at the same time, we don't want to portray it as a purely negative and just kind of gritty and dark issue um, because our experience with people from North Korea isn't that. It's not like meeting tragic people that are crying all the time and like kind of damaged people or like these kind of things. You know, these are normal people and they smile and they laugh and yeah, they cry as well. But we want to have more of a balanced portrayal of the North Korean people out there, more of a, more of a humanized thing. Yeah, in general more so than what was out there previously. In general, you know, we want more of a hopeful view of this issue out there because that's how we feel about the issue. I think that that's has kind of been lacking traditionally. And so we want to portray people in different lights and hopefully that's coming through in that way. You know, we also just face a difficulty of we can't show as much as maybe other issues and NGOs working on different humanitarian issues can show. Because as a security issue, we can't take photos in the field, you know, in China and show refugees' faces or show locations and these kind of things. And even when people resettle in South Korea, normally we can't show their faces. It's just a small number of people for their own reasons, you know, happy with showing their faces, whether it be their whole family has already come to South Korea. And so there's not that kind of risk of putting their families in danger. So there are structural challenges that we face. And, you know, our media team tries to get around that. I'm sure it's not perfect, but the overall thing is trying to balance out the picture of North Korean people as people that, yeah, maybe have faced really severe challenges. And it's important to recognize that, but they face those challenges with incredible resilience and they've come through, you know, they've overcome and they may still face challenges in their resettlement here. But overall, we see a lot of reasons to be hopeful of, you know, future progress for these people as individuals and for the issue in general as well. You mentioned previously that Liberty in North Korea has helped over 400 refugees. Where are they now and what are they doing? The vast majority of North Korean refugees that we've worked with and that we've brought through uh, have come to South Korea and around 5% have chosen to go to the United States. And then obviously some people will temporarily, even if they resettled in South Korea, maybe they're studying the United States or those kind of things. And in terms of what they're doing now, What are 400 people doing? They're doing all sorts of things. A lot of the people that we work with are younger in their teens or 20s or 30s. And so a lot of people are studying. Our resettlement assistant staff are constantly updating us with good news about people that we've worked with who are now entering university in South Korea, for instance, and sometimes getting admission to some of the best universities in the country here, which is, of course, great to see. 
people you know studying all, all sorts of subjects engaging in different types of work often people are studying and working at the same time and really working hard and you know saving up money and sometimes sending that money back to their families through these broken networks that we've mentioned before sending remittances back to people in North Korea yeah there you know there are people that have had kids in South Korea have married South Korean born people or married North Korean born people and they're living their lives basically yeah to conclude if our listeners want to get involved with you and support liberty in North Korea what is the best way to do that and how can those who have little to no money to spare contribute Sure. So there are different ways to contribute to this work on North Korea. The first entry point, unsurprisingly, would be our website, which is libertyinnorthkorea.org. Uh, it's liberty in North Korea, all as one word, and then .org. We also, you know, are operating in the main social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. And people can follow our work there. And uh, through that and through our website, there are different ways to support and get involved in our work. There are different opportunities to fundraise or donate. So even if you don't have a lot of capacity or, or spare cash right now to donate, then you can fundraise by setting up your own page and then being creative, doing something and kind of getting sponsorship from your friends, from your family and those kind of things. There are people that, for instance, will donate their birthday to this issue and ask for, instead of gifts, ask for donations. So there are various routes to contribute financially and then non-financially we do you know rely on volunteers especially in South Korea and a little bit in the United States as well for some of our work with resettled North Korean refugees so as an example we have English tutoring and mentoring opportunities here in South Korea for people that are interested in contributing in that way we have a rescue teams program which is not just students could be different groups of people and they're all over the world and they work in their local communities whether that be on their campus or within their company or within their religious institution uh, or just community in order to bring more people in support of this issue this cause on the north korean people and to do fundraising drives and also to work on changing the way that people see north korea at their local level as well um, so there are multiple ways, depending on where you are in the world and uh, where you are, you know, with how much time you have and so on. But yeah, I'll just ask people, you know, to kindly visit our website and be in contact with either of our offices around the world in order to support our work. Again, we don't have government sources of funding and these kind of things. We rely completely on individuals and, and private sources of support around the world to continue to do this work and to build it up to the next level. So, Keel Park, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. This is a great chat. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.